There is a brand new book called His Life and His Music, Dominic Triano, by Mark Doble, a good friend of Dominic, and his brother, Frank Triano. For anyone not familiar with Dominic Triano, it was amazing the impact he had on so many different musicians. This is a long interview. You'll get to know the man who was with the Guess Who, the James Gang, had to turn down Steely Dan. What the? You'll find it all in this interview. And it's a great, great book with a lot of fun stories and a lot of quotes from a lot of different artists. There'll be links in the description of this video and podcast where you can pick up the book. Here's our chat all about Dominic Triano. What was the process like for both of you putting this together? It was, uh, go ahead, go Frank. Ahead, Mark. Okay. Um, you, you know, it was interesting. We, 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 we kind of mapped out a plan. Um, I was going to uh, sort of draft the narrative, if you will, uh, where, where, you know, what, what, what Dominic did, who he played with, who, where, what they recorded, talk about the recordings and all of this stuff. Frank was reaching out to well over 200 people. As you can see, there's, I think we got 185 different, different uh, folks uh, giving us uh, submissions. And um, it, essentially we would take whatever they wanted to say and we would insert that into the narrative. And what, and what we really tried to do was where somebody came along and said something that I had said, we used their words because in fairness, they were there, I wasn't, and to be able to use their words and to allow them to tell the story. That's the nuts and bolts um, uh, way that we we kind of put it together to see see if that would work. Somebody said to us very early on, "This reads kind of like a Wikipedia piece." Well, that's exactly right because we have all of these different um, these different insertions. But the other part of this was we really wanted to have this book be a platform for all of these folks to give them their chance to tell the story and to, to, um, to pay tribute. Um, and, and, you know, people still wanted to do it. it 15 years after his passing, they were still eager to do that. And so that was humbling for us to be able to do. So in fairness, although Frank and I are the co-authors of this book, we really have about 185 other co-authors. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And Frankie, it being your brother, I mean, um, and it's close to home. Did it bring, it must have brought back an awful lot of things for you. It was a really, um, I have to say, it was a cathartic experience, John. Um, the, I'll just give my 25 cents worth about how the book got started. In uh, March of 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, I looked at the calendar and I saw that the 15th anniversary of my brother's death was coming up in May of 2020 a couple of months later. And I said to myself, I've been, I was going back and forth uh, a few times to do a book. And uh, anyhow, I just, it was overwhelming. But I, I re like Mark said, I reached out to about 300 people in March. I sent out about uh, several uh, group emails and um, I got back a good response in the first week, about six or seven really heartfelt tributes. And I said, you know what, maybe I could make this work. And then Mark reached out to me. He was on my list. Mark was a friend of my brother's and a super Guess Who fan. And um, he, he reached out to me and said, Frank, would you like some help? And of, of course, I needed help to put something like this. This is a a big undertaking what we had to do and so we worked I have to say uh, kudos to Mark we worked like a great team and we complimented each other I was out there hustling quotes doing interviews uh, Mark was weaving the narrative I, I mean I was submitting different things of my life but he was weaving the narrative while I was doing that other part and uh, I was um uh, I was setting up interviews. Mark interviewed five or six people that I kind of set up. And uh, it was great. He, and Mark is a great interviewer as well. And uh, anyhow, it all came together about a year later, I guess. And, you know, now we're in this long process of promoting the book and selling it. And it's been a wonderful, anyhow, getting back to it, it was a very emotional thing for me 
because of my brother, of course, losing my brother at a pretty early, at 59 years of age. And um, it, 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 it allowed me to relive my youth, all the beautiful memories I had of my brother and my family. And it sort of tied in a lot of stuff. And it really, I cried. I did cry a few times. When I started reading some of the tributes, it was very emotional. I think it was cool too that your sister was involved because it's kind of like a family affair. You have, <laughs> it's full circle as far as people, you know, giving their input, which gives more of a human aspect to who he was. The Alex Lifeson thing, by the way. I mean, it's, it's strategically, I'm glad you put it right in the beginning with the picture, the fact that he was a teenager and he comes up to him and Dominic is just not, not as, as you guys put it, not talking, well, he put it, he, not talking down to him at all. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it, Alex was absolutely fabulous, and there was an obvious connection um, that we 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 were aware of that story before we asked him, um, and 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 Alex, of course, had sat on the Dominic Triano Scholarship uh, um, uh, Fund, uh, and, like he was one of the the people choosing the the recipients. Um, and um, he also uh, played with uh, Dominic. They used to jam together at the Orbit Room in the later years. Um, so he he had a really uh, they, they had a they had a good friendship. And um, and the other thing, my my twenty nine year old son said to me, uh, Dad, if if Alex Lifeson writes the uh, forward to this book, I'll buy a copy. So uh, we figured we had to do that. But but here's the thing: what, what Frank was very good. When he reached out to all of these folks for submissions, we reserved the right to edit. And it was absolutely necessary that we edit um, these submissions. Otherwise, there would have been so much repetition. It would have been maudlin because people are pretty emotional about this. But Alex's submission, we did not change a word. We didn't need to. We had the same license. We could have if we'd wanted to, but it was perfect. I love yeah. the story when Alice got a chance to, to, to see him years later and to, and to remind him of that story. Yeah. Yes. I was there. I was at that event and uh, I didn't see them uh, talking about that particular thing, but I did, you know, I met him during the evening and they were on the stage wailing. They played one or two songs together and you haven't seen uh, <laughs> two better guitarists sitting on, well, I, I, in my humble opinion, <laughs> two of the best Canadian guitarists uh, sitting, you know, one, the older wise man and the other, the other one, the, the younger one who's had a tremendous international success, yet they were like blood brothers there. It was wonderful. I interviewed Bobby Rydell maybe three, four years ago, and he told me a little Freddie Cannon story. And uh, I found that interesting that Freddie would react that way to Dominic playing I almost looked at it as the old guard and the new guard coming in, but let, let me just tell you this story. I um, so Bobby is with the Dick Clark traveling, you know, whatever that tour was, and uh, Paul Anka was there, Freddie Cannon was there. They were roommates. He looks at Freddie Cannon and he says, "Hey, can you wake me up in the morning? I don't want to miss the bus." The only one taking a play was Paul Anka. Paul Anka then was much bigger than they all were, and guess who didn't wake Bobby Rydell up? Got on the bus. And Bobby Rydell's here is going, I, I'm too young. I can't miss this. I'm, I can't miss the next, next gig. So Paul Nacky hears him and says, hey, come on the plane with me. But he mentioned in the book and he went on in depth about, not that I want to crucify Freddie Cannon, but there's two stories right there. Like I, that, 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 you know, Dominic was still a young guy when that happened. He said, what the hell are you playing? I've never heard such bad guitar playing in my life. What would make someone say something like that? Uh. Freddie Cannon, I hate to say it, he's an SOB. <laughs> uh, and I don't, honestly, I, I, I say that with reservation because I, I saw him that night. I was at that event, by the way. Uh, Robbie Lane and the Disciples opened. Uh, they were the backup band for uh, Freddie Cannon, Boom, Freddie Boom Boom Cannon. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had had two or three huge hits, Palisades Park, and uh, hats off dan, to dan, 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 dan. <laughs> Anyhow, I mean, he was pretty successful. He was Italian, actually. That really hurt my brother even more. He's a Philadelphia guy. But he had such an attitude and such a... He, his ego didn't fit in that room, I'll tell you. Anyhow, and <laughs> I think the, the other thing that bothered him was that he was opening... Uh, I mean, Robbie Lane opened, then he was on. And then uh, 
Jerry and the pacemakers, he was pissed off at the British invasion because they were they were dominating the charts. I'm, I'm not I don't know. I'm reading between the lines, but I think he wasn't that happy about that. And he was a New Yorker, uh, not New York. Well, maybe he was from New York. Sorry, I might be wrong. Anyhow, he's a cantankerous guy. And I guess he got up on the wrong side of the bed. I mean, I hope he's not like that all the time. But it sounds like based on your story that maybe he's a bit of a mischievous guy, you know, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, I don't know. He's just, he doesn't take, he doesn't have brotherly love, let's say. Mark, you, you hit on something. It's, it's that thing where when it's an unwritten rule that you support one another, you know, guitarists go off and, uh, and, and see one another, you know, Randy Bachman had Dominic on his album, you know, uh, it, when you see someone who's, who is doing something that you find interesting, you don't have to love it, but it's in, I don't, go ahead, Mark, go ahead. Well, you know, I, I, I that, that, that is a, that, the, the story, it, it, it's a little bit um, irritating to think that he, he did this, but, you know, let's also remember that Dominic was 17 years old. When it comes right down to it, he was a punk. He was a leader. He was recognized as as the as the premier guitarist on the Young Street Strip at 17 years of age. And given the fact that he didn't pick up a guitar until he was uh, late 14 or, or, or almost 15, that's that's pretty good. So uh, Dominic had been stroked lots. He had he had the respect, and 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 he knew how good he was. And I would suggest that as a as a musician. It doesn't hurt every once in a while to get a little bit of, to be knocked down a peg or two, even if it is misplaced. And there's no question it was misplaced, but uh, it's part of growing as a musician. You got to be able to handle that and you've got to be tough. And uh, I, I think, I, I, I don't think it, I don't think it hurt him a bit. I don't think it did. Um, you know, it, it, it's, but when you talk about him playing with different guitar players, um, you got to remember when he was doing those reviews down in New York at Murray the Case, and that at that same shortly after that with the Mandala, that 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 you know Pete Townsend and, and the Who were on the same review, um, and Eric Clapton and Cream were on the same review. And after the shows, it was Eric Clapton and Pete Townsend going up to Donnie's room to learn about playing the guitar rather than vice versa. They're all about the same age, okay. And, and and so they 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 were like sponges learning from each other and hearing one another. But they had such a high regard. So when Clapton showed up at La Cave in Cleveland about a year later or two years later, um, and got on the stage to jam after midnight with uh, with with Donnie and play for about an hour, uh, I would love I would love there to, there to be a recording of that of that gig because here you had the, these two guys playing off one another. Um, no, I don't think it hurt him. I don't think it hurt him at all. Oh, Elliot Randall, some really nice words from him, reeling in the ears, tipping his hat to Dominic. I mean, who had to turn down Steely Dan? But see, that's another thing right there. There's another example of people, you know, tipping their hat, but also being classy about it, not forgetting where you came from, where you learned some of your tricks. Yeah, I, I was uh, Eric Mercury, who you may know, a Toronto uh, performer back right from the uh, 60s on, early 60s. He's a, um, he's a soul R&B singer. And uh, he had many, he had the soul searchers. He had many different bands. Anyhow, he uh, went to, he, he was signed uh, to a record label and he went to New York to record an album called Electric Black Man. And the uh, Gary Katz was the producer the Steely Dan producer. So this is before Steely Dan. And uh, they had, uh, Gary reached out to Elliot Randall to be the music director and, and, and create a backup band for him. So later on, they came, uh, Gary came to Toronto to visit Eric and he met my brother and he saw the Mandela and it made a huge impact on him. And then when uh, later on, when they were touring the album, uh, the Electric Black Man album, they played in uh, Whiskey A Go Go. Elliot Randall was there. Well, you read the story, but Elliot Randall uh, came along, you know, as part of the band. And uh, they, uh, all of the Bush, my brother's band Bush, came to see them on the first night. And uh, they, they became fast friends. And uh, 
and my brother showed him, he took him to Neil Moser to rewire his guitar. And that's the same guitar he used on that solo, the Steely Dan, Reeling in the Ears. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, my brother touched the lives and many people touched his life too. I don't want to make him put him on a pedestal, but he, he, he connected people. He wasn't, he wasn't hiding secrets. He shared, he loved to share later on when he became successful in the James gang, he shared with everybody, all his friends, with myself. He flew me down to New York. He was very generous, almost to a fault. And he would lend money to people that were down and out. Some of the roadies that had left that were, they weren't good enough to be in the James gang or the guess who he would give them money behind the scenes to help them, you know, and just things like that. He, he didn't even, he didn't even hesitate. Anyhow, that, that my point on Elliot Randall, he, he's a great guy. I had several discussions with him. He lives in London, England, and he was so nice. Uh, th this is really early in the process. Eric gave me his email address and we connected and you saw what he wrote, but uh, it's really nice stuff. Very heartfelt. With Steely Dan, it's interesting. First of all, he joins the James gang. Dominic joins and, uh, you know, he's dedicated to that. He's committed himself to that, but re replacing Joe Walsh, uh, Tommy Boland replaces your brother. I mean, that, you know, again, yeah. you got to do the work to be surrounded by that kind of stuff, but we're, I'm overstating the obvious. But it's interesting that, you know, that Steely Dan gig, you look at that, and for a split second, I look at alternate universes and I'm going, you can't help but go, what could have been? You never know. Yeah. You know, and I've thought about that too. Dominic and I, we talked about that in the late 90s and, and he was invited to join Steely Dan on not one, but two occasions. One, the first time he had just made a commitment to the James gang. And then two years later, after uh, uh, Denny Diaz left the band uh, the, or Steely Dan, um, they called him up again and he had just made a commitment to join the, the Guess Who. And Dominic, you know, he, he once he made a commitment, he was going to stick to it. Um, and and what would you think musically? What uh, how incredible a fit that would have been? And I think it would have been it would have been uh, musically it would have been phenomenal. Practically, however, I, I look at them and I think to myself, we like Fagan and Becker, um, the leaders of Steely Dan. Their standards uh, they 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 were they were they had their own ideas and they they were going to have it was going to be their way or the highway. And to a large extent, that was very true of Don, Donnie as well. And I, I, I'm just wondering if that third leader in the band, um, if if they would have, uh, how long it would have lasted? Because I think they would have come to they they would have come to some kind of conflict. Um, not that he, any of them were wrong. It's just they were all very very strong willed. And when you know any group that Donnie was in, even if he was only 16 years old, he was the leader of the band. He was doing all the arrangements. He was writing all the music, and he he had definite ideas. Um, it's why he walked away from uh, from uh, from uh, uh, Romp and Ronnie Hawkins, a very lucrative gig for a sixteen year old kid. But it wasn't the music he wanted to do, and he was determined to to follow his muse, if you will. It's interesting that he uh, uh, see the last two Burton Cummings uh, uh, Guess Who albums. Believe it or not, that was the two first Guess Who albums I ever bought because of my wow. age. Because I was in 75, I was 15. Yep. You know, um, and I loved them, having known the hits, but not much else at that point from the Guess Who. Yep. Now it's my business to know. Um, and I like, I like those two albums an awful lot. It's interesting they say, and it's, it's insinuated in the books, that a lot of people have said that that was the start of the decline, even though Burton wanted to go out and do his solo albums. Um, I, oh, I was interested to see you guys say that I, I think um, first? your backyard, your backyard. That's the one I haven't heard it in years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Of course, that's going to happen because albums that don't make it here will end up sometimes over here. Yep. But I didn't know that. Yep. Um, I, I agree with you um, musically. Um, the music on flavors and power in the music. There's, there's certainly nothing substandard about it. It was it was fabulous music. It was definitely a departure from what they had been doing with Randy Bachman and Kurt Winter. Um, uh, they, the Randy Bachman, and Kurt Winter, they they were much more commercially oriented writers, and they 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 wrote with Burton at the time. Jack Richardson, the producer of the Guess Who, um, uh, gave a sort of a backhanded shot at uh, at Donnie one time in the studio, 
and um, uh, Blaine Pritchard uh, quoted him on this. And, and Jack said to uh, Donnie, um, you know, Donnie, you may be the finest guitar player in Canada, but you haven't got a commercial bone in your body. And, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think I think there was a certain amount of truth when uh, even Donnie admitted that um, he, he knew that it was it was it was a departure. But but there's no getting away from the music was good. And um, all of the guests who and Burton Cummings as, as, as well were fully invested and they knew exactly what they were getting when Donnie joined the band. And they were like Burton and Donnie were joined at the hip for the next uh, 15 months, uh, touring and recording together, um, doing interviews, totally supportive. The bottom line was Burton wanted to relive uh, or re-experience the level of success that the Guess Who had achieved with American Woman and Share the Land in 1970, because he hadn't, the, the, the subsequent albums just didn't do that. And although Flavors actually sold outsold the 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 the, the, the guess who albums that had just been done uh, prior to that flavors and power in the music were nowhere near share the land or american woman and so from burton's perspective i think the experiment was over um but um you know i i, I think musically it was still great as a live unit uh bill wallace and and uh who's the bass player with the guess who uh, Gary Peterson, who played the drums, they both claim the guests who never sounded better in concert than uh, when they were led by Dominic. Yeah, Bill gave some interesting quotes, and he really pointed out the fact that that he was intimidated, but they they, they just brought it up a notch, right? I mean, yeah. that's that's what you want to do. So uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, Frank, I find it interesting when I got to that point. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I read this last week that. Okay, you're, Dominic buys a house. You go to LA to be with him. You want to help him renovate. You go in there, and he's playing with David Foster and Willie Weeks. And I mean, like, this is top shelf stuff here. Was that like was he was he just rehearsing, or was this did I did I remember it wrong? Was they were they were in the putting, studio? They were putting together a, a few. A, well, I don't want to say a super group, but a fusion group. Yeah. Uh, and really, based on the people that were there, they, it was a super group. And I didn't realize, here I am, I had already been there the previous two week, two weeks before that, helping my brother. And then I drove down to Mexico. I went to Vegas, lost some money. <laughs> and uh, I went to San Diego Zoo and sat with the gorillas in, in their cage because I had lost money. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Anyhow, I, uh, I finally, I did the rounds and I finally came back. And uh, there's my brother, uh, I, I'm knocking on the door, the door was open, I go in and my brother's in the basement for, an, an, I, well, it was a split level, not a basement, but a, a, low, a, a lower area. And there's David Foster, who I had never met before, Willie Weeks, who I knew had been on the Tricky album, and uh, 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 what's his name? Kenneth Rice, Spider Rice, yeah, mm. uh, great drummer. And I didn't realize I was in the company of some of the best musicians in the world. I'm just, uh, I was 20, 22. I mean, you know, whatever. I just didn't realize who I was with. And so they played uh, for another hour. They per, uh, I, I went up, made myself a sandwich and they played for another um, hour uh, rehearsed. I mean, and, and he's after they left, my brother said, that's David Foster. And he said, he's, he's, a, he's a, a keyboard prodigy. And I kind of went in one ear at the other. And then he said, that's Willie Weeks. You know, then he told me. And I, I, I didn't, re Willie Weeks went on to play with Eric Clapton for 22 years in his band. Can you imagine? And then so, you know, all of them. And well, of course, David Foster, I don't have to tell you. But, and uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, well, I don't want to say it's unfortunate, but that's when the, uh, that's when the Guess Who got involved shortly after that. And after, uh, two months of rehearsing or two and a half months uh they you know he he realized well anyhow he had the offer he didn't really want to I'll be honest with you he didn't really want to join the guess who he thought they were a pop group and he he did a lot of soul and I'm not that's with no disrespect to the guess who they're a great band apples but, and oranges yeah a little bit so uh he he called me a few times about it like later on when I went back he he had the firm offer 
And he said, Frank, I'm really struggling with this because he wanted to be with Foster and the other guys. But I guess the offer was so good. They offered him 25 percent, 50, you know, the 50 50 writing, all that stuff. And, you know, it's just uh, it. Anyhow, he took that decision and they really sweet talked. I mean, the manager called him 10 times. Burton called him repeatedly. Gary was an old kind of an old friend of his, the drummer. And he talked to him a few times and he finally was convinced. And anyhow, he did it and he had fun. It was, you know what? It was like a paid holiday for my brother, you know, going first class. And he, you know, he put a lot of effort into it, but it was a kind of a relaxing two year, almost two years, 18 months, whatever it was. The parents, it's, I like the parents perspective that um, you're, I mean, A, your dad was a ho- sort of, I don't know if he was just a hobby guitarist. He played at weddings that you'd said in the book. Yeah. And your mother wanted Dominic to, you know, to pursue his dreams. And I can, I can get that. It's usually... I ask every musician that same because we're doing a whole skit on it. Do you remember those conversations with like the uh, your father knew? I mean, your father knows it's not a good bet. Music's a bad bet. In the 80s, you saw we go. You can go gold and ride the bus in Canada, you know, but. Tell my me about father, that. it's really my father became the enemy. Uh, I hate to say that, but it, he became the enemy with my brother. Uh, a- enemy in a light way, but. Uh, you know, going against his dreams and uh, being disappointed and having his uh, his grades falling in grade 12 and 13. And my brother was a very smart guy. So my father didn't understand it. And well, he knew what was going on. He had devoted himself to music. He was playing at the Lecoq Door Tavern in grade 12 and 13. Imagine Thursday, Friday. No, Thursday, Friday night, Saturday. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, the the. Uh, the school regimen in those days was really hard. We're talking in the in uh, the mid uh, early '60s, so the standards were very much harder than they are now. Uh, at least the the difficulty of the exams, all that. So my brother's marks fell, but he became the enemy. And then sort of I kind of turned against my father because I saw I sort of thought, why is why is my father doing a roadblock against my brother? You know. And well, anyhow, but I mean, it's just those things when you're a teenager, you're going through the angst of being a teenager. So it took me a while to to get back on board with my father because I was supporting my brother more, you know. Um, And anyhow, my father finally saw the light when he went to work for Ronnie Hawkins, uh, at at least when Ronnie uh, allowed Robbie Lane to join him as as the band leader and, and his band. All of a sudden, my brother was making 125 a week. He was making more than my father. <laughs> Can you imagine? In 19, uh, the, the musicians are actually the musicians now are making less than that. I, I'm sorry to say, but the uh, it was like a big all of a sudden. And then when he left, brought when he let when he walked out on Ronnie, he went from 125 to 30 bucks a week, and my my father and mother had a fit. I mean. They didn't, I don't think, I think he kept it a secret, but they knew he never had any money. So they knew something was up and I, I kept my mouth shut. Uh, I didn't want to start a war there, but uh, oh, it was something else. Uh, How, that- however, if I can, if I can observe from afar a little bit on this, you know, it's how many rock and roll biographies do you read where the, the, the kid uh, got kicked out of the house? He was um, ostracized. He was, uh, he was kicked out of the family, if you will. He got, you know, he was strung out on drugs or or hit rock bottom, and and he he survived because he had to, and all of this kind of thing. That's not the Dominic Triano story. Um, the Frank and Pasqua Triano, uh, sorry, um, uh, wow. the, the 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 Triano parents really supported Donnie when it came right down to it. Although. Um, although his dad would have loved him to have gone on to uh, university and he was certainly capable of that and, and become a professional and a success, uh, you know, second generation Italian immigrant family, um, those were the dreams. It's only natural. But um, when Donnie made his decision to go the direction, you know, it, 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 when it came right down to it, his dad and mom provided a great deal of support. You know, he, he was playing... He was playing at Lecoq Door. He was coming home at night at three o'clock in the morning. There was never a night where he didn't have a place to sleep. 
There was never a, a day where he didn't have breakfast and, and dinner. Um, he never had to worry about that because mom and dad were supporting him all the way. Now he may have he may have disapproved of it initially, but he still supported him. He really did, and I think you have to you have to say that. And when you when I talked to Frank, um, he he family was so important to him, and he was so grateful for the support that he got, not only from mom and dad, but also from brother and sister. Yeah. He, he, family was everything to him, and um, this is not a story of a broken home or anything like that. It's it's almost the the anti rock star story um typical that's it's 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 somewhat untypical but you'll read in the book you'll read of uh, all of these rock stars that ended up um having a a, a traditional uh homegrown italian dinner at uh, 356 salmon avenue in east york um some of the biggest names in rock and roll and when you talk about dominic triano they'll bring up the food that uh, pasqua prepared for them and and uh you know she made she made a homemade pizza and gina delivered it on her bicycle over to uh, hazelton avenue to nimbus nine studios when the guests who were recording flavors uh these are the stories but uh so no no the the parents um they may have they may have been worried about the decision that Donnie made. They may have disagreed with his decision, but ultimately they supported him. Oh, there's no question. I, Dominic really liked the fact with the, Ronnie Hawkins, he, he uh, it's, it's mentioned a few times that, you know, the, the, the musicianship, obviously look who he played with before, yeah. it's Ronnie Hawkins, but there's there's that level of, of, uh, of I, I could see him for a while being in there going, yeah, yeah, this is, this is the bomb here being here because, you know, I got to play at my best. Why? Well, of course, I can play at my best. Um, tell me about that era for him. Yeah, that he, I have to say, you know, Ronnie uh, had a boot camp, a musician's boot camp. And, uh, you know, literally between playing five sets, practicing till three or four in the morning. And uh, by the way, Ronnie never came to the practice, except uh, unless he had a, uh, possibly um, uh, a meeting with a, a person of the opposite sex upstairs in the private area, but he would, he would uh, anyhow, he, he, but his word was so powerful that nobody would veer from his direction, from his orders. And he was so forceful, but anyhow, he, he, he brought out the best in his uh, musicians. Uh, David Foster played for him as well. Um, uh, after my brother, well, it was a few years later, uh, and a whole slew of musicians. I, you know, I I can't name them all. Hundred, probably dozens, maybe hundreds. But he brought up, he brought the musical level up of pretty well anybody. And if you couldn't cut it with Hawkins, you were gone. You know, a week or two later, he would say, "Sorry, son." You know, he have his ah shucks mannerisms from Oklahoma. Ah shucks. Uh, he, you know, it's not working. You know, I guess he would be polite about it, but uh, uh, it, it was a great experience for my brother because you know what it did? Even and my brother was already very rigid in, in his practicing, but it really made him two levels above where my brother was. And every band that my brother ever had after that, it was the same relationship. I mean, well, not the same uh, in my brother's style. But it was that same idea that you've got to get better. We have to progress as a band. And um, as you can see, eight or nine of my brother's fellow musicians made, <laughs> they worked with Elton John, with Supertramp, with uh, Lou Reed, with uh, Alice Cooper. I mean, obviously, the people that came out of his bands became most of them became super successful as more like sidemen, but still as part of, I mean, if you're touring with Alice, uh, with Elton John for six years, uh, as Fred Mandel did uh, for my brother's first solo band, that's pretty incredible, you know. Anyhow, uh, it, it was a good experience, even though it was uh, a love-hate relationship a bit, it was a great experience working with Ronnie. I like the, uh, put a little butter on it, put that guitar in the oven. Mike Levine, as guitar player, uh, coming up. Can you can you reiterate that story? That's just, that's just like one of those. Dominic, you got it. I think that uh, Donnie was obviously having them on a little bit. Um, the, these uh, young kids um, 
um, where they, they, they were almost the next generation, it was really only half a generation apart, but almost the next generation of budding rock and roll guitar players. So they wanted to somehow duplicate that sound. How do you do that? Because let's face it, it was a pretty unique sound. It was a, it, it was, yeah. it was amazing. And so Donnie, of course, he had a sense of humor and he'd just call them over and he'd open the guitar case and he'd show them. And he'd say, you know, we take this and we put butter on it, and we, then we put it in the oven and we cook, we heat it up to 350 degrees and you leave it there for 20 minutes. And then you, and, and, and I mean, so these guys, they, 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 they had the, they had the, uh, they had the butter out before they realized that Donnie was, uh, was just having fun with them at that point in time. But uh, no, it's a great story. But I mean, it, 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 it kind of speaks to the level of awe and amazement that these, uh, these musicians had for, for, for Donnie. Um, he, he just, and, and, and the other part of it was as much as he was having them on, he was generally pretty generous with his time. He was always willing to encourage them. And, uh, you know, he talked to, he talked to Alex Lifeson about how, you know, uh, to practice and to keep it up with for a 13 year old, you know, uh, Bernie Labarge, another, uh, Toronto guitarist who, uh, who uh, did a lot of work, in it with a lot of musicians, most notably the De the Dexters in the at the Orbit Room, um, you know, Donnie was just such an encouragement to him to the point where Bernie Bernie shared with me that that um, Don Donnie said to him at one point, he says, "Bernie, I'm not sure that you really appreciate how good you really are," and uh, it 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 uh, and that just that just I mean, what a thing for your, your, your you know your idol to tell you that. But um, he had been so attentive and so dedicated to his craft, trying to trying to learn so much from Donnie. And Donnie said, "You got it." And to get that kind of validation, but uh, see, D Donnie Donnie was tough. Donnie's standards were high, but he was still he still worked very hard to have a positive influence in in however way he could. Even if even if he fired you, he wanted you to feel good about yourself. And, you know, we've got stories of people that were that that didn't cut it. And Donnie would Donnie would get together. And say, you know, this isn't going to work. But by the time the conversation was over, the guy was fired, but he didn't feel bad at all. He still felt like he was part of the group. He still felt that that Donnie had had had, had given him something useful um, that he could use and go forward with. You Let's have... not forget, John, one one other point about that. Let's not forget Robbie Robertson. Yes. Robbie was the originator of those stories. Uh, he would tell people kept asking him, how do you get that sound? And he said to people, oh, I slit the speaker cone in my amp. And uh, and then they, the, the, the younger guitars started doing that and they realized that they just wasted 50 bucks. <laughs> and then the other thing, I think he also mentioned something about baking the guitar. I'm not sure exactly. I, I'm, I can't quote him, but uh, he was a real character too. He, he liked to pull your leg. And uh, you saw his quote in our book. It was just such a wonderful quote. And he, Robbie, uh, I sent out the, um, I, I sent out a, a request or at least an email to his personal assistant, legalist, I guess like a, an administrative assistant. And that guy gave it to Robbie on a Thursday morning and on Thursday afternoon, I had the quote, you know, unbelievable. I, I, I didn't know what to expect from Robbie. And uh, he was so generous uh, doing that. And it was a powerful quote. So I just want to tip my hat to Robbie. Tell me about the beret. Well, the, um, unfortunately, when my brother was a teenager, late, latter years of teenagehood, he started losing his hair. And he started buying all different, uh, he, he would respond to different ads about losing hair, thinning hair. He, he would be buying creams and this and that uh, over the, those two or three years. And, and then in the Robbie Lane of the Disciples, he still had, he still had a full head of hair on pretty well. It started thinning. And by the time the Rogues and the Mandela, it got thinner and thinner. He grew his hair longer, of course, to be, a, to be in fashion. <clears throat> but he started wearing, uh, I think he was influenced a little bit by Lenny Bro. Uh, Lenny Bro wore a beret. So uh, 
it might have been part of that or maybe his uh, kind of uh, being uh, close, you know, being uh, philosophically close to Che Guevara uh, and the, the Cuban, uh, you know, uh, all the guys in Cuba there. Uh, he, he, anyhow, he bought a Bray and he bought it downtown at his favorite store there that sold the different, all different kinds of hats. And oh, he did wear a bandana a bit uh, as well in the, in the Mandela occasionally, then, then the beret. And then he started wearing the, um, the larger hats as well on the guess who and different things. But the, his main thing was the, his trademark was the beret. Yes. It so good. Yeah. No, it was really, I started wearing it in high school myself. I, I went down there and instead of buying two or three, he, he liked navy blue and black. And he, I think his size was seven and three quarters. It was fairly big. And a lot of times they didn't have stock. So I'd have to keep going back. This is before the internet and all that, you know, you, you go down to Queen and uh, it was in the arcade, Queen and uh, Young around there. So Anyhow, one time when I went there, they had about they had a new shipment from the Basque region in, in Europe. I must have bought ten or fifteen of them, and then I uh, my brother paid for them all, and I kind of snuck a few of them for myself and my friend, my high school friend. And all of a sudden, we were wearing a beret in grade twelve. We, everybody was going, "Did you just go to Paris?" You know, it, they thought we were two jackasses, you know. But uh, uh, anyhow, we kind of wore them in sympathy or whatever with my uh, my brother. But yeah, he it was his trademark right, pretty well right through uh, from there. Yeah, something that didn't make the book uh, when I was interviewing Gary Peterson and Gary Peterson from from Winnipeg. Gary, Gary was a bit of a child prodigy. He, apparently, he was playing drums with the uh, Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra when he was four years old or something like that. His father was a big band drummer, and 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 so uh, Gary Gary got to play with a lot of people. So including which was Lenny Bro. Lenny Bro, of course, got his start in Winnipeg. He was a Winnipeg uh, jazz guitarist. And so, uh, so, so when Donnie was, was joining the Guess Who, um, and, and, and uh, Gary had such a high regard for Lenny Bro, and he had a high regard for, for Donnie Troiano, he said to me, you know, um, when I, I, I played with Lenny Bro when I was a teenager, and now here, and Lenny Bro was, was phenomenal. Here, I was getting to play with another guitarist who not only played like Lenny Bro, he kind of looked like Lenny Bro. They had the same complexion. He says he even wore a beret like Lenny Bro. So <laughs> for, for him, he thought he was, it was Lenny Bro reincarnated. Oh my God. The That's Mandela the kept coming up. I know you guys spent a lot of uh, time on that, on that group. Um, that's just, to me, sounded like one of those bands that just could have been, you know, that's just... You know, if enough people would have heard, I mean, they'd go to, they were playing in LA for, and, and uh, without a big hit. That's right. They didn't even have a record on the radio and they were, they, the, 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 the Mandela, I, I think a lot of the, the success has to be attributed to the promotion that they got from uh, Randy Martin, otherwise known as Raphael Markovitz. And uh, he, he worked in television in Canada and was, he, he, he understood that it was more important for the band to get publicity than anything else. Mm -hmm. So he would organize stunts and events. Um, uh, Frank has told the, the story of, uh, in, it's in the book, of, of Randy uh, showing up at their home. He'd been down to New York City and he bought uh, brought home a strobe light. And the Mandala was the first band to use a strobe light. And they would dress up in these matching suits. The visual impact of the dance moves, uh, the theatrics, um, and the music was kind of in the background. The music was always great. The music was always phenomenal. But the show was it. And so when they went to um, Los Angeles, and they were down there for about a month in, in the fall of 1966, Word spread like wildfire. They'd go to the Whiskey A Go Go. They'd go to the Cheetah. They'd uh, go to the Hullabaloo, and they would be lined up out on the street for people trying to get in. And some pretty big names apparently didn't get into the show. Yes, uh, Paul McCartney, the Beach Boys, all these—they're great stories if they're true. But Nancy um, it, yeah, and but the the fact is, they didn't even have a record recorded yet. They didn't have a record on the radio and they were packing these places out because of the fantastic show that they were doing. Oh, the Axe album, speaking of Randy, that's why I brought it up. Yep. 
I bought that album way back when. And uh, for, and Randy was one of those guys too, who's, who, you know, obviously a huge guitar collector, but a guy who just loves that instrument and loves people who play that instrument. Um, tell me about that, that experience. How did that, how did he, how did they hook up back then? Frank? Um, well, it, the, um, let me think. It was, uh, yeah, it was before Randy left uh, the Guess Who. It was, uh, I guess, was it after uh, American Woman? Uh, American Woman had been released, but uh, they, the, the band, uh, but Randy was still in the Guess Who at that point. Right, okay. Anyhow, uh, at RCA Records uh, agreed to do a solo album. I mean, obviously, the Guess Who had huge pull, and Randy uh, asked for a favor if he could do a solo album. So he went to the RCA studios in Chicago to do a solo album, just a quick album. I think it was only a couple of weeks. And uh, he already had in mind what he was gonna do. And he decided to call my brother. It was good timing because my brother, the, my brother's band Bush was just in the process of uh, disintegrating and you know blowing up. I guess it was 71, eh? Was it yes. no, 70? No, 70. 1970. Oh, 70. Yeah, yeah, 70. Yeah. So, uh, no, I guess they weren't breaking up yet. Yeah. But anyhow, it was during the book. Pardon me. I, I, I'm wrong there. It wasn't during the breakup, but my brother was in Bush. Anyhow, what it did was it gave my, well, first of all, my brother was honored uh, that Randy even, you know, thought of him to, to play on the album, number one. But Randy had seen the Mandela. Randy had seen Bush in uh, Winnipeg and the Mandela in Bush. Uh, I mean, sorry, the Mandela and Bush in Winnipeg, pardon me. And, uh, I, you know, he felt uh, compelled, I guess, to have my brother play on four or five tracks. And uh, the nice thing about it was my brother was basically broke. And it gave him an opportunity to uh, work with Randy for, I don't know, four or five days in Chicago, stay at a nice hotel, actually have some food to eat. <laughs> you know, good food, I mean. And then he flew the money he made. Of course, his number one priority was to go home to visit my mother and the, and the rest of us, my father and, and my sister and I, but specifically more so. He was extremely close to my mother and it gave him, he spent, uh, I don't know what it was. I remember when he came home and he, he, you know, telling me about the recording and I thought, well, that's neat. He's playing, you know, because American Woman, you know, of course, the band had notoriety at that time for sure, the guess who. And uh, anyhow, he came home and it gave him that bit of extra money. Then he went back to L.A. and, and, and was in, uh, in total poverty again. <laughs> anyhow, that... where, where do you think he'd be now? Wait, what would he be doing? I know that's a that's a larger than life question, but b- both of you, what do you think he'd be doing? Well, um, he became uh, totally dedicated to the studio in the mid 80s. And he had that really big break uh, doing film, film and TV scoring. It made him a lot of money and he, he built a beautiful studio. And he, then he had his own label, Black Market Records. And um, I, I think he would have eventually had, um, he, he had four or five different artists that were close to success, but none of them really had, they had a bit of success, but nothing major. But I, I think he would have, between doing, uh, uh, making money from the TV and m- movie work, it would have given him the money to invest in, few, in further artists. He probably would have had a, 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 a David Foster, I don't want to say a, a level of David Foster success, but maybe something ap- approaching it, where he would have somebody, you know, one of the artists that he did find would, would have become a, a, hopefully a household name. And he would have carried on because he had the drive and the money and, and of course, the talent and everything else, all that part of it, that he would have clicked eventually. But as he got ill, you know, that all went to the wayside and it all, un, you know, everything unfolded. But I, I think he would have, I mean, he may have, I don't know, he may have, he would have played here and there, I think, but only for, not, not as a career, just to... Uh, just for his own uh, his own pleasure. You know? I, I think that Donnie would have been dedicated to his musical craft until he couldn't, until the you know maybe not till the day he died, but until he could, simply couldn't do it. I think he would have been mentoring 
other musicians he would have been paying it forward there's no question he was doing that in uh, he was doing that in the last five years of his life anyway um he would have played he would have continued to be involved he would have continued to make music um i i think it would have been almost impossible for that not to be the case he was so dedicated to his musical craft and i don't think that would have stopped in any way shape or form would have slowed down a bit like we all slow down but um he uh there, there would have been something he would have had some there'd be something that wouldn't have got done there would have been a project there would have been something that he would have been working on and and he would have been so focused on it and dedicated to it and committed um music was his life music was his muse music was his reason for being sound like a guy who liked to close files but the last thing he wanted to, to not to happen is have a, a file open someplace there's that thing having an autistic daughter it's all about closing files closing files okay i'm going to draw this i have to finish it no matter what that's taught me an awful lot about the most ex like real expertise in music a lot of these people even though if some of them are hoarders and uh, they have a lot of problems but there's one thing the best always do is they they're really good at closing files and then they want to reopen another one but I'll tell you a story on that. Um, back in uh, when I first got to know Donnie, um, I, uh, I I had some Guess Who bootlegs of of him playing with the band that, that he'd never heard before, and so I uh, packaged them up and I sent them to him in the mail. Um, they, I had them all burned on CD and everything. And about uh, three months later, I said, "Have you listened to those CDs yet?" Oh no, Mark, I haven't got around to it yet. I haven't got around. But thanks for sending them. I really appreciate it. Three months later, after that, I said to him. Donnie, have you listened to any of the music? He says, Mark, quite honestly, I appreciate you sending them to me, but I am more focused on what I'm working on now than what I did back in those days. That's all there is to it. And he was always, he was looking forward. He, he cared about his musical legacy. Um, you know, getting the, 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 the Mandala and Bush and the Guess Who and the James Gang reissued on CD. He had a, a central role in how that was done mm -hmm. because he cared about that. But it, for him, it was all about moving forward and, and looking at tomorrow rather than yesterday. We all need love. How did that come about? It was during the recording of the third Capitol album, Fret Fever, uh, towards the end uh, or during the, pro basically Capitol was giving my brother pressure to come up with a, a hit single. Uh, it, subtly, I mean, you know, they, picked, they had already done three, that was the third album. So they, um, they, anyhow, they were, he was getting some pressure from Rupert Perry and, and at Los Angeles and whatever, you know, we need, you know, in other words, uh, 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 you know, you get, you know, let, let's try and justify you staying on the label, you know. So uh, he, he kind of was racking his brains. I was in the studio. That's what we were all in the studio, you know, watching and, you know, during the recording process. And he came up with a song. And uh, really, it was a biographical song because he realized that uh, he, had, he had done some mistakes. He had made some mistakes in his life uh, by, uh, I wouldn't say not so much by a mistake, by ignoring, by letting uh, things slide, uh, more important things slide, like personal stuff. And um, not, no, no, I'm not being there because he was so consumed by the music and by his creativity and by his, uh, he was just so focused on that that he let, he let other important things slide. So he realized that um, he had become too um, egotistical. If you want to think about, uh, uh, about we all need love, we all need love was the exception to the rule. Dominic Troiano has repeatedly been referred to as the musician's musician. Musicians, musicians don't have hit singles. Their fans are all other musicians. So they don't get the same, they get the level of respect as musicians, but they don't get the same level of popularity. But, and, and typically they, they're not interested in it, but we all need love. It, it was a great song, a fabulous vocal with Roy Kenner that helped carry the song. Uh, well written, and it 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 was a huge record for uh, the group W in in Europe uh, a few years later 
But We All Need Love was a hit single, the exception to the rule of the musician's musician. Yeah. Well said. Well said. But the, uh, it, yeah, We All Need Love became a, my brother's theme song, and he really tried to live that style in the years after. And he really became, it, it, what I, yeah, very, well, he was always a great guy, but he became more so. But what I wanted to say was my brother included me in, in the early years, in my early teenage years, he included me in all his activities. He encouraged me. He took me to see uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers. I was 12 years old. He took me to see the Rolling Stones. At least uh, he was playing. He was uh, opening for these bands. The Rolling Stones. Imagine in 66, seeing the Rolling Stones just as satisfaction was becoming a number one hit at the uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. He took me to see the Animals and Herman's Hermits at the, at the baseball stadium, at Toronto Maple Leaf Baseball Stadium. Uh, he took me to see Santana, you know, meeting Santana, like all these activities. Um, he, he wanted to include me. He flew me down to see the James Gang in New York when they played at Carnegie Hall. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is he, he included me. He spent lots of money doing that. And then when I looked at all the other musicians in all these different settings, not one of them brought their brother or sister to any of those things. So that takes a special person to do that because I was, to be honest, I was a bit of a brat, a bit of a, a young punk. And I, I said the wrong thing, I'm sure repeatedly, you know, when I was in these people's company and uh, he probably had to whack me a few times, you know. Uh, but and then he, he told me to get off the stage after the Rolling Stones had finished performing. I was on the stage waving at everybody. You know, <laughs> I had become an egotistical whatever. And I uh, and anyhow, he called me and said, Frank, get off the stage. And then I went, picked up his guitar. We went to the car. But anyhow, he was a great brother and I love him dearly. And and there was so many wonderful memories. Mark, I would like to think that we have written the book that Donnie would have wanted written about him. Of, co of course, he wasn't here for us to write with, but um, we had lots of, lots of fantastic interviews. Um, and for me, the sounding board has always been uh, Frank and Gina, uh, Sean, uh, Rita, the, the, the Troiano family, if you will, um, and, and the extended family of people like Roy Kenner, who sang with them and performed with them for decades. Um, they were like brothers. And as you can see, he was quoted throughout the book and their validation means so much to me. This has been a humbling experience. Um, this has been a rich experience because I've recognized that so many of the people who interacted with Dominic had the same experience that I did. He cared about you. He was interested in your, your well-being and um, he was always interested in paying it forward. He, he was certainly rightfully proud and confident of his accomplishments, but it was never egotistical. It was always with a degree of, of humility and gratitude. He was an exceptional human being. And so for me, this has been nothing short of an honor to write this book. Well said, well stated, uh, Mark. I hope you enjoyed that. I want to thank Frank and Mark for joining us and talking about this fantastic book, which I so enjoyed. Links in the description of this video and podcast where you can pick it up. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Book, Rock History Canada, and Rock History Music. Mm -hmm.